walking by faith and not by sight. You know, to please God, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. You, 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 uh, you have to walk by faith to please him. You have to walk by faith to be accepted by him. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says this, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. I find this interesting. In, in a world of statements like it doesn't matter what you do, that we shouldn't put any forth effort, it's all grace, Paul says we labor to be accepted of him. The apostle Paul, the preacher of grace, said, you know, so many people call, a lot of people call him the preacher of grace, and he was the preacher of the word. He preached grace, he preached faith, he preached healing, he preached commitment, he preached holiness, he preached all kinds of things. You know, they call him the, you know, the preacher of grace, he was a gospel of grace. Well, right here he says, whether absent, we, he's confident, he says, whether, whether they're absent from the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 5-9. Five, five, whether we labor, uh, wherefore we labor, labor, whether present or absent, that we may be accepted of him. In other words, you know, Paul said, if I do all these kind of things and then I become a castaway, we don't want to become castaways. Amen? We want to live our life pleasing to him. So if we're going to, if we're going to be uh, accepted of him, we've got to walk by faith. Why? Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. Amen? So, you know, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so here we have, we have terms, we have two terms already that denote effort on the part of the believer. One is that, that he, he, what, he does what? He, the, he labors in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, he talks about diligently seeking. So there is an effort on the part of the believer beyond laying down and just looking up at the ceiling at the finished work of Jesus and not doing anything and everything is going to happen for you. These are misnomers. Now, we're not talking about doing things in, in the power of the flesh because, you know, <clears throat> as my, as my uh, friend Guy Dunnick says, and he has, a, he has a series of books on grace, but one thing he talks about is strengthening grace, empowering grace, sustaining grace, the different types of grace that we really find in the Bible. And when you understand them in context, you find out that's, that grace is more than just simply undeserved, unmerited favor. It, it, carry, it can't mean that because if you put that definition in different uh, passage where the word grace is used, it makes no sense, you know, but we find out that his, he's got sustaining or he's got empowering grace, so uh, you know, the grace of God is at work in us, but we still have to labor, there has to be effort on our part, in other words, we got to do something, amen, now it's not that, you know, you go up before the Lord and say, you know what, I, I, I said, you know, 500 Hail Marys, that's going to get me in, that's not going to get you in, or I, I laid hands on 600 people today, that's going to get me in, that's not going to get you in. But you do labor to be accepted of him by walking in accordance with the word. You put forth the effort to walk according to his word. He'll help you, but you're going to have to put forth the effort. Effort. Draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto thee, says the Lord. Did you notice he didn't say I'll draw nigh unto thee and then you can draw nigh unto me? He said you draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto thee. Well, that, doesn't go, that doesn't really go along with a lot of people want to teach and say. So, so there's a laboring to be accepted that without faith, and, there, and, and so he says without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that comes to him must believe that he is. Now, that's how many, you know, how many requirements are put on the, on the person coming to God. Now, listen, these are not, these are not overburdening or overbearing requirements, but they're still requirements. You're not going to get saved just because you're going to get saved. You've got to believe that he is. Now, can I say something? In witnessing the people, you need to take the pressure off of you. Yeah. See, we think if we had the right argument, if we said the right things, we're going to get them convinced. No. Nope. If they're going to come to God, they must believe that he is. Dan Hagen used to tell the story about the, about the guy who came to him. I want to talk to you after service. He'd been pre ministering service, and the, and the guy said, well, I'm... I'm uh, either, I'm an atheist, well, maybe not an atheist, but may, I, I may be an agnostic. I don't believe that God, you know, I'm not sure that God does exist. He said, but if you'll convince me, you know, if, if you can't convince me that God exists and get me saved, then I'm going to die and go to hell, you know, if there is a hell, and it's going to be your fault. And, and Brother Hagin just looked at him and said, well, 
He said, you know what? And after arguing, because he, he got to arguing, he said, you know, the Bible says they that come to him must believe that he is and he's a reward, you know. And, and, and you don't believe that he is, so you're not going to go, you're not going to go to uh, get saved and uh, goodbye and walked off. Guy get mad with him, stick his tongue out, and did this several times. And then finally he prayed for the guy, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm really shortening and paraphrasing the story some, but, you know, but that scripture would just like be like standing at the foot of his bed and talk to him. He came to him and said, Brother Hagin, I don't, I'm not the same, I, I'm, I'm different. That, that, I, I, up all night last night, that was like that scripture was standing at the foot of my bed. He that comes to God must believe that he is. I understand it. I've got to believe that he is before I can come to him. You see, you, you, when you're witnessing to people, your responsibility is to preach the gospel. And the Bible doesn't say this. And he, he whom you convince will be saved. The Bible says, go preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth it and baptized shall be saved. Yeah. We've got to take the pressure off of our efforts to convince people. And go back to letting the Word and the Holy Spirit do the work that they're designed to do in a person's life. And if they reject it, they reject it. You have no power over that. Other than to intercede for them, that God will continue to minister to them, and God will continue to send labors across their path. But it's obvious there are going to be people who go to hell and reject Jesus. Now, I'm not saying let's be hard-nosed about it. What I'm saying is that when you go and you think that you, you know, <clears throat> and you'll hear some people, they think, they think you know, that they're going to get it all done. You're not going to get it all done. Without the Holy Ghost and without the Word, you can't get it done in the first place. And it's not your, your responsibility ends with the preaching of the Word and allowing the Spirit of God to take the seed planted and begin to deal with that person. Other than intercession for people. But you can't convince them. You can't make them. You can't sit there and try to figure out an argument that's going to fix it. No, no, no. That's, here's the problem. It's not your arguments. Paul said we do not follow the cunningly devised fables. Amen? As a matter of fact, he said this. He said our speech and our preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. The, uh, what? That the people's faith would rest in the power of God and not in the wisdom of man. Amen. And so we have to come to the realization that we are to <clears throat> share the truth in demonstration of the power and the spirit and then let God do the rest. We, what did he say? He says, you know, we talk about to the church at Corinth and their dissensions among themselves. And talking about the fact that, you know, that he didn't save anybody. He said, you know, I, I, I said, um, he said, I sowed the seed, somebody else watered the seed, but God, God gave the increase. God gave the increase. Amen? All right. Now, I'm saying this to let you understand, you're not going to be able to convince everybody. You're not going to be able to make everybody believe. As a matter of fact, it's not you doing the making them believe in the first place. Either they accept the truth. And listen, I don't believe the Bible. Is, and you're just wasting your time with me. It's not, it, it, that book's just a bunch of paper. And God's not real. I, I, I got a bumper sticker in my car. It says, a dog I trust. <laughs> and all that stuff at you. You know? I don't believe there is a God. Well, you share the truth with them. You ask the Holy Spirit to deal with their heart and send labors across their path. But you don't need to sit there and get in a philosophical argument with them and try to convince them what to do. They, gotta come, they that come to God must believe that he is. Amen. And that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now, when you got people who just flat out reject it, you can't make them. Oh, if you just give them the right message. No, 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 wait a second. You don't think the Holy Ghost knows who to get across their path? Amen. You don't think the Spirit of God knows the right, and you minister to them? You don't think the Holy Ghost sent you? Across their path? Listen, people rejected Jesus, and he's standing there in the flesh. Working miracles, signs, wonders. Amen? All right. <clears throat> so, Romans 8, 8, here's the problem. People are flesh ruled. They're so flesh dominated, they reject the truth, even when they see truth, or they see the miracles, signs, wonders. They'll have an explanation for it. They'll have a reason for it. Um, Romans 8.8 8 says, So that they that are of the flesh cannot please God. Now, let me say this. Um, let, let's, let's run over to Romans 8.8 8 real quick. I'm kind of hopping around a little bit on, on where I'm going with this, but, you know, we'll run off, come back, run off, come back, run off, come back. 
So what? Number one, we have to labor to be accepted of him. Whether president or, in, or, or, or absent, we labor. Hebrews says that without faith it's impossible to please him. And then Romans 8, 8 says that if you're in the flesh, you can't please God. People who believe that you can live any way you want to live. I was listening to Sister Wilkerson, Jean Wilkerson, the other day on old tape from 1981, listening to her. And she was talking about um, walking worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. And she got to preach it on holiness. Now, that's something we don't preach a lot in our churches anymore. Well, number one, because it, it puts people's flesh under, under constraint. It, it inhibits people from doing what they want to do. And we live in it. It's all about me society. Do you understand why the, our country's in the state it's in right now? It's because everybody wants what they want, and they don't care what the consequences are anywhere else. People sell national secrets to other countries that could destroy our nation. Why? Because they're going to get a lot of money. They don't care about the millions of people, the hundreds of millions of people they could defect. They're going to get rich. People rob people. People steal. People, uh, people lie. People vote for people because they're going to get something. It's all about them. They don't care about the, the, the whole. There's all kinds of stuff. And that, that spirit has entered into the church. And remember, it is the spirit of Antichrist. Why? <clears throat> Jesus said that he, the Son of Man, did not come to be ministered to. He came to minister. The spirit of Antichrist is all about me. What's in it for me? If there's not something in it for me, I'm out the door. We, people, people look for churches. They don't look for churches where God could use them. They look for churches that's going to give them something. I'm talking about beyond the Word of God, the, the preaching of the, of the Word of God, the manifestation of the Spirit. It's what are they going to do for them? What's in it for me? You know, do we, do we have this kind of ministry, that kind of ministry, and whatever ministry, this ministry, and that ministry? And I'm all for all the different kind of ministries, but I'm saying is that Spirit. So the churches are all running out trying to cater to that. You don't have people, and when people preach holy, they run to the church that tells them they can drink wine and they can smoke dope and they can have stogie parties and beer parties at the church with the men's, at the men's meeting because we don't want to talk about holiness in the church anymore. But I'm going to tell you something. Lack of holiness will affect your faith. Sin is a faith inhibitor. Amen? Because I can tell you this, if you're walking in sin, you're walking out of love. Amen? They're open for business next door. Yeah, yeah. My wife's over there. <laughs> you guys want to go? You can go over next door. Miss Janie. Out of here. All right. <laughs> Didn't take them long, did it? <laughs> All right. So, if you're living in the flesh, you can't please God. You can't, you can't have faith toward, your, your faith toward God will be inhibited when you're living in the flesh. Amen. The Bible, 1 John says, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Your heart will condemn you when you're living in sin. And if it doesn't, there's something wrong. Yeah. Oh, that's because I got a revelation of grace. Now, you got a revelation of stupid. Hello? I got a revelation of grace that I can live with my girlfriend and shack up and fornicate, and it's all right, and God's still going to bless me. That's a stupid revelation. That's a revelation that came out of the works of the flesh and out of the spirit of Antichrist and not out of the spirit of God. The spirit of God says, Come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. The Old Testament gods would cry out and, you know, and say, I'm, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And, and they would cleanse them with the coals off of the altar. And then they would say, Here am I, send me. Amen. God told Moses, take the shoes off your feet. You're standing on holy ground. God is a holy God. I don't know how I got out of faith in the holiness, but it works. <clears throat> take off your shoes. The ground you're standing on is holy. God didn't stop being a holy God just because we got to a new covenant. God didn't stop being a holy God because of the, 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 the power of grace. Are you here? God 
is still a holy God. As a matter of fact, when Jesus is on his horse, he's, there, there's, a, there's a banner on him that says, Holiness to the Lord! Holiness! We got people running around thinking they can use their faith and be homosexual. Use their faith and live in a lesbian lifestyle. And they come crying, wondering why they're not getting any answers to their faith. You're living in sin! We are to labor to be accepted of him. That means you're going to have to put stuff down that some people go, <clears throat> brother, it's okay. I, you know, look, you can't walk in their revelation. And sometimes you don't need to walk in their revelation. Are you here? Oh, it don't matter what I do. Ooh, I got such a revelation. No, no, no. What you're, what you're finding out <clears throat> is Jesus paid the price and Jesus made the way but you still have to labor to walk in it. How? By resisting. The Bible says to submit, your, <clears throat> submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Amen? Notice that in, in, you know, he didn't say lay down and let the grace of God do it all for you. I, I, I know I'm being sarcastic, but I'm so tired of hearing this stuff, and I'm so tired of people being deceived by the, the, the no effort message that is erroneous scripturally, that does not line up with the word of God, that teaches people they can do exactly opposite of what the Bible says do, and God's still going to bless them because he doesn't really care. If he didn't care, he wouldn't have written anything in the New Testament except get saved, you're under grace, see you in heaven. That would have been our Bible. New Testament. Jesus fulfilled the law. You're saved when you accept Jesus. You're under grace. See you on the other side. Do whatever you want to do. But that's not what the Bible teaches. You read Peter, and Peter says, add to your faith virtue. And you had virtue, kindness, and this. He goes on this about seven or eight things down there that you're at to add to your faith. And if these, look over there, 1 Peter. I believe it's 1 Peter 1. If it's not, then it's 2 Peter 1. But Peter wrote it. Well, I don't know what Peter wrote it with. Well, I don't really care. We're not going to have a stupid uh, d this debate from a bunch of scholastics. It's listed as Peter writing it. The person that wrote it, wrote it by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. You have people say, well, I don't, Peter, Peter, Peter didn't write Second Peter. Were you there? It was a different style. You can read stuff I wrote now, you can read stuff I wrote 30 years ago, and they ain't the same. Um, I know I'm talking about faith. I said walk by faith. We're talking about uh, successful faith walking by living right. All right, changing the title here. Simon Peter, a servant of the second Peter one, a servant of the an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Stop. Who is he talking to here? He's talking to the saints, talking to born again believers on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? They've obtained like precious faith. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. And besides this, giving all here's one of those words again, those effort words, those words that require something on the uh, behalf of the believer. Are y'all here? You're going home. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to your virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance. Now, temperance means not doing anything in excess. Hello? Temperance, patience. The patience, godliness. Godliness, brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness, uh, love. Now, you probably, probably had here, you probably had uh, Phileo and, and, and Agape. And if, this, if these things be in you and abound, he didn't say that they were in you and they were abounding. He said they be in you and abound. They could be in you but not abounding. Why? Because if you don't give diligence to them, they won't abound. 
They shall make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. But he that lacketh these things <clears throat> is blind. Here he's talking to unbelievers. Let's go on and read and find out if you're right or not. And cannot see a fault and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give, here it is again, diligence, oh, to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fail. What happens if you don't do these things? You're going to fail. You cannot preach a message that says that you, can't, you don't have to do anything and you're going to succeed when the Bible says if you do these things, you will not fail the uh, the. the and the antithesis of, that, antithesis of that being that if you don't do them, you are going to fail. As a matter of fact, he says, if you don't do them, you're blind and have forgotten. Amen. Are y'all here? you go home. And so the Bible is very clear <clears throat> that our, our walk of faith is something that we, that part of your faith walk is not just believing for a car or a house or a wife or, you know, your needs met and your bills paid, your body healed. Part of your faith walk is pleasing God and walking and using your and, and, and living by faith to believe God that you'll be able to do the things He wants you to do by faith, to follow His commandments by faith. Look, you go to Hebrews chapter eleven, and I got something stirred. I got, I got like this kind of series, kind of you know, the attributes of the heroes of faith. Well, we'll see when it comes out. How does that sound like a, a, a dissertation? <clears throat> Hallelujah. You know? I mean, the attributes of the heroes of faith. You know, you know, you got Samson was different than David. They all did stuff, but the, the, the things they dealt with and the way they, they accomplished and the way they ended up doing what God told them to do, they came different paths. Amen. And I guarantee you we could find something about you in each, in, in somewhere, everybody would fit in somewhere with the people that, in Hebrews 11. The prophets, you know, the different ones. We could just go down and listen and talk about their attributes and how, you know, what they did and, and how they struggled and how they overcame and then they fulfilled their calling of faith. Dan Hagen used to say this. Some people think we're going through life on flowery beds of ease. And then I added to that, singing tiptoe through the tulips. I don't know where we were. Re oh, I know we were. We were, we were at Graceland. And they had, for some reason, they had some show and they had Tiny Tim on the, on the, the sets in Graceland on some talk. I don't know why they had it on there. Maybe, maybe Elvis was going to be on there or something. But they had Tiny Tim on there singing to Miss Vicky. Tiptoe through the tulips. I'm not going to do it. Nathan can do it just like him. Anyway, get this ukulele out and start strumming. It says, tiptoe through the tulips. Anyway. But notice Peter says that if these things be in you and abound, amen? Isn't that right? For if these things be in you, you they, they shall make it that you're neither barren nor unfruitful. What does that mean? If these things are in you and abound, they'll make it that you're neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. With the not in you and they don't abound. You can become, he said, nor unfruitful. You can become unfruitful. And Jesus said, I would that you bear much fruit. We need to stop giving, you know, people, this is a marketing technique that the world uses. You're going to get something for free. I got, we got a, a coupon in the mail there, a thing of coupons, and from Hardee's. Free fries and drink, fine print, with the purchase of. Well, then they ain't free. I can't walk in off the street, put that up on the counter, and walk out with a fry and drink and spend no money. Are you here? It's a It's a catch. Now, I don't mind. I mean, I, okay, I, I, I'm will, if I'm willing to go pack, get the ham and cheese sandwich and get a free dry, fry and drink with it, okay. But you usually find out you haven't really, they, they've broken at least even. They haven't lost any money. Because they've got it figured out, okay, uh, if they buy the ham and cheese, it it's costs three fifty nine, dollars 40 dime, whatever. And our cost on that and our profit on that, the profit on that will cover the drink and the fry. So we didn't make it, we didn't lose any money. Didn't make any money, but we we got customers in the door, and maybe they'll buy something else for their kids with them or whatever else, you know. And we can't go from the church and start offer, offering people a gimmick to get them to come 
and tell them, you know, it don't matter. You know, God doesn't care what you do. Do you know what Jesus said? Repent. That means going to the end. He didn't say, now I know, don't take me wrong. I'm not trying to, but you know, come, just, just come, you know, uh, just as I am. I have this great song. And, and, and the song is better, than the, the, but just, just the mind, I'm trying to talk about the mindset that people have. Just come, it doesn't matter, God, God will save you, and, 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 and you don't have to do anything. Well, the truth of the matter is, Jesus said, go and preach the kingdom, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, that's a little bit different than what we do a lot. We try to make it so palatable, and so easy, and so you don't have, there's nothing required of you other than, you know, you, you just come down or whatever. And don't take me wrong. I'm, I understand righteousness. I understand the work of God. I understand Jesus paid the price. But there has to be something in the heart of the person that says, I must change. I've got to do, I've got to, I've got to go a different direction. Amen. I have to go a different direction. Because if you hook them, and then bring them into a church that everybody's drinking and fornicating and everything else, and they say it doesn't matter, you're, 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 you're just going to, you're going to damn them to a life of misery. There has to be, now I know we're talking about the center, and, and, look, I, and I, look, we can go a different direction. And our dad told the story about the woman who didn't want to quit dancing, and he told her, you can dance all you want to, and she got saved and came back and said, I understand what you mean, the want to's gone. See, I'm going to tell you something. When you, have, when you have experiences with God, things change. But the church has to mature and train those believers. And you can't tell them, oh, don't worry about it. It's all right. Keep living like you're living. God don't care. Yes, he does. Now, if somebody's struggling with something, you know what? That's okay. God's, God has strengthening grace and empowering grace to help you walk out what he tells you to do in his word. Yes, he wants you to... You don't need to tell people that God doesn't care they're doing something. Yes, he wants you to do that, but he's here to help you achieve that. If you'll cooperate with him, he'll, he'll lead you. Draw nigh unto him, and he'll draw nigh unto thee. He'll help you overcome through his spirit and through his word, through, through the different things. We, we need to stop telling people that it doesn't matter. It does matter. And we're thwarting their ability to live by faith and to please God by selling them a lie. I can't use my notes at this point. What's new? So Peter here, he said there's given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, verse 4, that by them we may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so he tells us we've got scriptures that enable us to partake of the divine nature. We need to be telling people. You need to be a student of the word. You need to act on, you need to be doing what the Word says. When the Word says stop doing something, no, listen, I'm going to tell you something. The Apostle Paul wrote and said, you know, he that stole, let him steal no more. Working with his hands, doing that which is right. You know, are you here? He didn't say, if you used to be a thief, that's all right, God don't care, keep being a thief. He said, stop doing it. And then he writes about the works of the flesh and talks about those who do those things, practices them, when they have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. The church needs to be preaching the whole counsel of the word of God. You know, see, see, some of the things we're teaching there are, are really just extensions of and, and, and more off-center than some of the stuff we used to teach when we taught righteousness. Some of, the, some of the teaching on righteousness was so, and the love of God was so far over that it didn't matter what people did, they couldn't, they're, they're still righteous. It don't matter if you're living with five women and doing that or that, you're still righteous. You know? The Bible says if you practice those things, I'm going to tell you, you can get to a point, you, you do Hebrews 11.6. You don't want to do Hebrews 11.6. Now, I've shared, you know, with a, a, who used to be a friend of ours, and this person, you know, I mean, they were born again, filled with the Spirit, prophesied, 
I mean, you know, walk with God, serve the Lord, sat and, I mean, tasted the good, the, the good word of God, powers of the world to come. I mean, everything, you, <clears throat> now, now they, they, they uh, tell their husband, they, they, they say, I spit in the face of your God. They're all off on some guru, crazy West Coast lunatic thing. Taught, they write a blog about how, how and, and, and mocked the blood of Jesus. I know this person. I, I witnessed to them, and they got born again. Came into the church, got filled with the Holy Ghost. She, for years, served God. For years, walked in the things of the Spirit. Sat in good word churches. But somewhere in there, well, one, one of the things, the pride got in. Pride comes before the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit before the fall. I can tell you they were full of pride. Never, did, never really did deal with their pride. I knew that all along. When they used to say things like, ah, you know, I like to hear pastor so-and-so preach, but I love it when the, the assistant pastor, that wasn't me, I love it when so-and-so preaches. I said, hold back. Even in my younger days, I was smart enough to know, you don't start putting affection and affinity on associates and, and, and assistants beyond the pastor as a member of the flock. Yeah. We got in this Sunday morning, you associates and, and, and assistant pastors and associate ministers and so forth and associate pastors and churches, you're operating under the covering of that senior pastor. And you better make sure you direct it to the, the one that God set there as the senior pastor or lead pastor, the new words, lead pastor now. You're operating under, under their anointing. They get to come in and, and share all the fluff and puff. Pastors got to get up and deal with the stuff. And we had it here. We had, we had one person in our church that if I was preaching there on the back row, if, if, if the other guy was preaching there on the front row, I mean, on the edge of their seat taking notes because they love to hear him preach. Come early. Stay late. And I, the, the next verse, I'm back at the back, at the back, late, came late, left early. They just loved. I mean, they, that was, they, they were their Holy Ghost. I mean, if they spoke it, it was God. And it'll lead you astray in life. We have to get back to living a lifestyle that honors and pleases the Lord. That we, sancti we, we were sanctified. I know we hate that word. Good Lord. We're vessels of honor. We're cleansed before the Lord. Now this is not an effort of you didn't cut your hair or you, didn't, you wore the right kind of, you didn't wear makeup. We're not talking, I'm not talking about that. That's, that's external show. And none of that without an internal cleansing and, and sanctification going on. Having our minds and our thoughts cleansed and purified. Having the right intent of the heart. Those things that Peter lists over there in 2 Peter chapter 1, did he, know he didn't say anything about what you wore? And he doesn't. He doesn't. One of his places say, Talks about the, the adorning, that would be the outward adorning, not, not the outward adorning, but of the plaiting of hair and the wearing of gold, but of the uh, adorning of the heart, of a quiet and meek, uh, peaceable, uh, quiet and, quiet and peaceable, peaceful spirit, quiet and peaceful spirit. Now, that, that, see, Pentecostals, I grew up Pentecostal. We jumped on that and said women can't cut their hair, they can't wear gold. They, he said wearing apparel, you can't get, you, we can't have women coming to church naked. And what, what he's talking about. He's talking about don't spend your time on the outside, spending it on the inside. And what I'm talking about is not spending your time on the outside. I'm not talking about coming in here and, you know, having the right clothes on. And the <clears throat> although, listen, if, you're, if you want to walk with God, you shouldn't want to be uh, looking like a, like a street woman. I mean, we, were, we had to go to Walmart today, and I'm walking, and me and, me and Shannon are walking. She went, Lord Almighty. <coughs> Girl in there and her stream bikini top and, and, and Daisy, I mean, put Daisy Dukes, make Daisy Dukes look like Bermuda shorts. Buying her some suntan lotion. You know, you felt like uh, uh, Larry the Cable Guy. Lady of the evening, lady of the evening. La anyway, y'all ever heard that it was the night before a non-traditional uh, non winter holiday? Go home and look it up. 
Hallelujah. But Peter talks about, you know, not the outward adornments. We're not talking we're not talking about it. We're talking about issues of the heart. <clears throat> and we like to use this when it's in our favor. Guard your heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it are the issues of life. We love that one when it's on a positive note. We need to guard our heart against pride. We need to guard our heart against, you know, lack of integrity. Hello? We need to guard our heart against things that are not godly and then try to run off and cover it. You know, um, someone told me recently about, a, you know, the, these guys were, were at a, at a they were actually a, 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 like a late night, like a, like a steak and shake type of place. And the, and the server there, they had, they'd been waiting on by before, and they tried to witness to him. And they said, well, you know, you remember guys, when you guys used to come in with so-and-so, they had another friend that used to come with them a lot. He said, I have a hard time accepting your testimony about Jesus and so forth when this guy, named the guy, said he hit up on me, started, started pursuing me, and he was supposed to be a Christian going, you know, being trained for the ministry and stuff. And we took her to bed. And once he got her in bed, he just dumped her and dropped her off like a... And he told her how great God was and tried to, you know, shared all this stuff, told everybody, how, you know, he, he tried to witness to her at the table while they were all sitting there and stuff. She said, I'm having a hard time with that. And I don't blame her. But you see, you're under grace. It don't, yes, it does matter. Woe be unto thee if you cause one of these to be offended. If she rejects Jesus because something like that happened to her, now listen, she'll have to pay that price, but God's going to talk to somebody about it. And it ain't going to be a, it ain't going to be a fireside chat, it's okay, buddy. Because you did not walk in integrity, and you did not walk in pureness of heart and holiness. Now God can forgive you. David, until David was, was dealt with by the prophet of God, he was hard-hearted about this issue of adultery and murder. Even pronounced his own sentence. And only because he got up and repented did God forget, did he get out of that. As the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, that man shall surely die. You be the man. And he stripped himself of his robes and he went and he mourned and he repented before God. And God forgave him. God, God can forgive, but let me tell you, that wasn't the way it was supposed to work out, and damage was done because of it. There was damage wrought because he did not walk with holiness and purity and integrity. We should never have this. The story of David and Bathsheba is not a love story. It's a lust story. It is a story of the flesh. And the only redeeming quality is the power of God's forgiveness in the midst of human carnality. And we thank God for that. But as born-again believers, David had the Holy Ghost on him. You got the Holy Ghost, didn't you? I mean, we sing, I got the Holy Ghost down in my heart, just like the Bible says. Oh, I got the Holy Ghost down in my heart, just like the Bible says. We start singing that and dancing and shouting. Woo! Glory to God. We ought to be living a lifestyle that demonstrates the Holy Ghost living down in our heart, just like the Bible says. If y'all don't want to get any more enthusiastic than you're getting right now, that's okay. I'll keep preaching it. Because it's still true. I understand. See, sometimes you've got to come back here and kind of get whoop, over here to get people to wake up that are over there going, it don't matter what I do. Yes, it does. Then you don't want to get over here and say, you're all going to hell if you so much as sneeze wrong. No, that's not true either. God's, going, but God's just waiting to get you. God's not waiting to get you. But you can't keep walking in rebellion to his word and rebellion against his will and expect him to continue to bless and to do and to honor your actions. It just won't work. I don't care what anybody with a cute hairdo and a cool TV setup says. You've fallen for the marketing. Now listen, there's a restaurant here in town called Red Lobster. And they market like crazy on television. But then there's this little 
almost a hole in the wall because it's so old called Captain Bill's over on uh, Market or Friendly, I, I think. So Market. They got the I, I've eaten popcorn shrimp at, at Red Lobster. They, they don't match up to this guy. He's, he's just a little $5.95 popcorn shrimp special. And it is mwah. And he don't mark it. His marketing is a little sign out there in front of the thing. Popcorn shrimp, $5.95. <laughs> That's his marketing. You know? Don't get marketed into walking contrary to the word. We get, we get you know, Christian television can be a bigger blessing than it is. Because people watch that and that becomes their pastor. You need a pastor. You need a, you need a church. You're out there sitting at home. I just do house church. You can't do house church. You need a church. Yeah. You need a pastor. You got somebody you can submit to. You can't submit to the television guy. Yeah. I'm sorry. He was never called to be. You were never called to submit to the television guy. The Bible says to submit to those who have the rule over you that they may give an account for your soul with joy. Some guy in California can't give an account for the, somebody in North Carolina's soul who sends him money, money every month. See, we all can put the best foot on. We can put the best foot forward. God wants us to put the Holy Ghost foot forward. And then the Holy Ghost foot next. God wants us to walk and labor that we may be accepted of him. Amen. To give all diligence to have all these things in us and abounding that Peter says. Amen. And to give diligence. Listen, you know, he says, look at verse 10. Wherefore, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm under grace. I'm already, it's already settled. He says you, got, you have to give diligence to make it sure. Very, very interesting scripture that people, that people avoid like the plague, especially in our circles. It says this. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I, I've been around a lot of Word of Faith preachers, and I've been around a lot of Word of Faith churches, and I haven't seen a tape series yet. Maybe somebody somewhere has one, but I haven't seen one on the table going, working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Because we think those are all negative. That went over big. What's the time of fear and trembling? We have to stand in awe of displeasing God. It should be reprehensible to us as a believer to dishonor and to displease God. And then when we do, godly sorrow overtakes us and we repent for it because we've dishonored our Father. Now, no, you don't go live in the mire and 25 years later you're still testifying on the, on the, on the show about you know, you know, how, how, how rotten you are. I'm not talking about that. That's, that's not Bible. But there should be godly sorrow when you have sinned. And there should be godly repentance when you have sinned. Then you can experience godly restoration and wholeness. Amen. That is a faith walk. That is grace working in your life. He said, let us come with boldness to the throne of grace in the time of need that we can receive help. But he also said that godly sorrow worketh repentance. What's worldly sorrow? I got caught. I'm sorry. Yeah, I've, I've had, sometimes when I'm substance teaching at school, you know, kids are getting to something, and I'll say, you guys, you've got to stop that. Now, you tell, tell them you're sorry. Sorry. Oh, no, no, that, that ain't going to work here. Like you, did you mean it? No, well, I said I'm sorry. No, no, You said it, but you didn't mean a word of it. You're still thinking the same thing you were thinking before you said you were sorry. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. That's what it means. It'll bring a change in your life. 
You don't say, sorry, Lord, I fornicated with my girlfriend, and next night you're doing it again. When you, have, when you genuinely believe you have dishonored God and you have violated the temple of the Holy Ghost, come on now, then it will bring a godly sorrow to you that you'll seek God for repentance and restoration and to overcome. Amen. Well, how do I not fornicate my girlfriend? Don't be alone. Hello. Turn all the lights on. Raise the blinds. Put padlocks on the bedroom door. Call neighbors up you don't even know and say, come over and have coffee. No, you don't, you just don't, you don't. Listen, the Bible says don't give any occasion to the flesh. You know what it says? We make, we make no provision to the flesh. I think this is a song, there's a, there's a little chorus, but it's a scripture that says, we are the circumcision, we worship God in the spirit, and we have no, I think we have no confidence in the flesh. Let me tell you, here's, here's the Ed Taylor thing. You don't make provision for the flesh either. Amen. If you, this is what we're talking about laboring. If you're going to labor to be accepted of him, you're going to have to overcome some stuff and you're going to have to put it down and you're going to have to say no. All right, forget sex. I can't. Well, you need to. You need some help if that's where you are. Amen. Amen. Let's talk about gossiping. You might walk into a crowd of people gossiping about somebody. Talk about the pastor. Yeah. Sit out at dinner and talk about the pastor. Yeah, that Ed Taylor. Yeah, you know, I, I, he, he's, you know he preaches good, but. You, know, you may as well say, the time when he, they say but, you say, oh, I'm butting out of here right now. You can cover the tab. Hello. Or you stand in a circle, and they're all talking. Well, it's time for you to leave, because I ain't going to sit here and listen to that. Amen. Well, you just don't know. What. I've been there. Had somebody took pastor. My pastor was out of town. I was preaching for him. And uh, this lady in the church came up to me after we got done preaching. Now, we were young. We, we were so young. No kids. I mean, we're Jane, Jane and I are young. I'm, I'm working at Parker's and, 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 and preaching in the church. And she's working at the drugstore and going, finishing up school. We're somewhere in that age. You know, or, or she just, got out, just graduated and got the job program or whatever. So we're real young. Married, been married one or two years, preaching for the pastor. I'm trying to think where we were. Now, it was the first year because we were that, that we were downtown at the old Edwards Hardware building on 10th Street in Greenville, next to the Hollowell's Drugstore Number One. And um, it's no longer, you know. Anyway, and uh, I preached, and she came up after service. I wanted to take us to lunch. We thought, wow. She said, where do y'all want to go? We, there, was a, there, was a, there was a restaurant in town we like to go to. There was. Uh, um, I forgot. No, it was it was it was a sit down place back in Greenville. Back in those days, it was kind of nice, and it was like it was like uh, it, it was either the King and Queen or the Beef Barn or something. It wasn't the Beef Barn. It was the other. It was another one there. Anyway, um, she took us to lunch. We sat down, got to order anything we wanted on the menu. Woo! Praise God. Thought, man, I'm being blessed. Praise God. There's always a limitation. You gotta watch people because there's a hook, especially people who want to use their money. There's a hook. You, know, you may not see it until later on, but there's a hook. And uh, she got about halfway through the meal, and she started in. Oh, I want to tell you something about Pastor John. And I, let him get, I gave her enough rope to hang herself real good. Because then I laid into her. But I, I just took her up one side and down the other. You know? And uh, she paid for the bill. And as soon as Pastor got back in town, I was on the phone. Pastor, here's what happened. Here's what I said. Here's what she said. And she was in his office the next morning. He had her in there. You can't do it. You can't be going, listen. So you got to have integrity. I used to have people come to me in the, in the church in Greenville. They'd say, man, if you start a church, I'd go. 
That same devil came over here to this church and told people the same thing. They were telling people in the church, if you start a church, I'll go over there and be with you. They followed him to another church, but they were going to go over to their church and help them start a new church right here in town. Tell them. Tell them before they ever started one. If you want to start a church, I'll go with you. That's not God. God don't work like that. God's not trying to hurt things and divide things up and tear things apart. Anyway, they come to me and say, you start a church, I'll go with you. I said, if I start a church, it'll be so far away, you won't be able to go with me. I said, I, I'll, I've always walked in that place of integrity. I won't do it. I said, I won't do it. I, I refuse to walk out of integrity. When we came here, we took a church. <clears throat> After we were here, moved here, taking the church, we're pastoring and setting in and doing stuff, found out that this church had gotten started kind of uh, out of, uh, out of the, pa the previous pastor taking people out of another church and starting it. You know what I did? I made an appointment with that pastor. I said, can we come talk to you? Sat down in his office and said, look, I don't, I, I came without all the information. I said, we didn't know that this church started from a group coming out of your church. It's not that big, but it still happened. So I've come to ask you for your forgiveness and your blessing for us to continue to go forward. I said, I want to I ask your forgiveness on behalf of, that, of this church for, for doing what it did to do that. And he did. He said, I forget, you know, he says, you know, you don't, you don't have to do that. I said, well, yes, I do. And then he, he, was, he was in the middle of a split at the time. And a bunch of people had come to church over here. I said, I, I told him, I said, look, we'll, we'll help you. But we want, our, our job is to get you back over there. They all left because they were, they were all getting ready to do a big major split with that past, that, that, uh, associate Wolf. Not associate, last name Wolf. Associate Wolf in Sheep's Clothing. Who ended up getting caught making 900 phone, 900 number phone calls from his privately installed telephone in his office. The deacon board found the, the, the bill and found that he was calling sex lines. You don't think walking out of integrity will catch up with you? It'll catch up with you. You young ministers, you're watching by, by, on the internet, you don't think that sleeping around while you're in Bible school or while you're in a young associate or while you're young in the ministry, you're traveling around, you don't think pornography, you don't think living in sin is going to catch up. It's going to catch up with you. And the consequences are going to be destructive. God calls us to a higher place. Oh, I got people healed. I don't care. Jesus said to people, he said, you know, Lord, Lord, did we not do works in your names? Did we not do this in your name? He said, depart from me, I never knew you. God cares about the people, and he'll minister to the people however he can, can minister to the people. But he requires of us that we labor to be accepted of him and to diligently seek him and to add with all diligence these things to our life. We should be pleasing to the Lord. David said, put a, white, put, a, put a guard in my mouth that I might not sin against thee. Say this. As a believer, Jesus said, if you think it, you've done it. We need to put a guard over our minds so we don't sin against him. Jesus took it up higher. Do you think the New Testament got easier? It got higher. Back in the Old Testament, they could think it. As long as they didn't do it, it was okay. They, as long as they didn't do it, it was all right. They, got, they could get away with it. But Jesus said, if you look at a woman to lust after, you've committed adultery already. Well, he upped, the, he upped the ante. He didn't make it the ante lower. He upped it. That went over big. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Going to sell a lot of these tapes, I can tell. How many want to buy one tonight? Now you're going to go watch. I know you're going to go home listen to it for free on the Internet. Anyway. That all being said, we're going to please the Lord, aren't we? I said we're going to please the Lord, aren't we? 